Well, good evening, bonsoir. Thank you for coming and thank you for staying. <laughs> I uh, think, although my grasp of French is tenuous at best, that uh, Professor Hublin has given you a very fine, a masterful summary of events in Africa and uh, the expansion of the earliest human populations out of Africa into Eurasia. I think it's left to me at this point simply to add some footnotes, uh, perhaps a few personal remarks and a, a summary, a, a perspective from my own point of view. I've worked at Demonisi in Georgia for 13 or 14 years at this point, started uh, back around 2000. Um, I managed to miss most of the most important discoveries because I, I stay for part of the field season but then go on and do other things and the, the best fossils always turn up at the end of August. So I haven't seen very many of them in the ground. Demonisi is important, as you already know, for a number of reasons. Perhaps we can cover them again very quickly. You know where the site is located. Uh, Demonisi preserves certainly some of the most ancient traces of human occupation outside of Africa. Uh, we have a pretty good date uh, for the basalt underlying the deposits containing the humans, the animal bones, and the artifacts. The basalt itself is 1.85 million years old. Uh, there's been a long history of work at Demonisi. Uh, in the earlier days, much of it was focused on the medieval settlement at Demonisi. The archaeologists were excavating some of the old buildings occupied a thousand years ago. Uh, they turned up peculiar looking animals. Uh, they called in one of the paleontologists from the museum in Tbilisi, Abesalom Vecua. Uh, he was very quick to discern and to point out that some of these items were in fact extinct Pleistocene fauna, ancient animals that had no business in the food waste of medieval humans. Uh, there's a lot of evidence of this sort from Demonisi now. Uh, we have uh, lots and lots of animal bones, uh, not just mammals, but a few other sorts of animals as well. Uh, there is a, a very extensive collection of stone artifacts, uh, certainly not all of them tools, uh, not all of them utilized at all, but an interesting assemblage of stonework. Uh, and finally, and perhaps uh, most importantly, we have five or six human individuals that are remarkably well preserved considering their age. Also, of course, it, it's fun to be in the field at Demonisi. We have a field school in operation the last five years. It's become quite successful. We started with just one or two students, but now we have 12 or 15. So if you have students of your own, uh, look us up and send us some good people. Uh, you've seen this or something pretty much like it. Uh, Demonisi is situated in the southern part of Georgia, uh, almost on the Armenian border. One can walk from the site. It's not very far. It's a dozen kilometers or so uh, down to the, to the Armenian frontier. Uh, it's not very interesting to go there. Uh, the border guards tend not to be very friendly. This is a picture, a photo that was taken from the air. It's something you've seen earlier t uh, this evening. Uh, medieval Demonisi was right on the Silk Road, a portion of the Silk Road, uh, the thoroughfare uh, connecting uh, the Orient, China, and India uh, with Mediterranean Europe. I think there were stops in Arabia as well. Uh, you see the citadel, the, the medieval citadel in the foreground. There's an old church. Uh, uh, bits of buildings here and there. In fact, the settlement was larger than that. Uh, people were living all across this promontory. 
Uh, you see where the awning is stretched over the trees in the background. That's the actual fossil site. Uh, excavations have been underway there for some time. Uh, you know that uh, the site is on this promontory situated at the confluence of the Machavera and the Pinozauri rivers. It's the Machavera. Right here, this is the Machavera River Gorge. Uh, that's the excavation area under the tarp. Uh, the promontory ends up here and the Pinozauri is off on this side. Long time ago, uh, 1.85 million years ago, a vast flow of lava came down through this gorge, uh, spilled out over the promontory, um, and it is atop that basalt that the sediments occur in which our fossils are recovered. There's uh, the Pinozauri, that's the Machavera. Here's the site. Uh, it turns out that the sediment pile in which the human bones have accumulated, the human bones, a number of the animal bones, and also a number of the stone artifacts, uh, can be dated to about 1.77, 1.8 million years ago. Uh, the basalt itself, 1.85 marks the, the bottom of the sediment pile. Uh, we have all told uh, about six meters of deposits uh, compressed in the main site, block two, block one, block two. These areas were, block one was excavated first uh, back in the 80s and through the 90s. Block two was opened up in uh, 2000 or so. Uh, excavations are continuing today in this northern portion of Block 2. Um, there are a number of M localities, M1, M2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Uh, these are simply test pits. Some of them were dug uh, during earlier periods in the excavation uh, and then just left fallow. Uh, M6 has been explored more thoroughly. M5 also has been explored very extensively over the last four or five years by Reed Faring, the geologist who works at the site. Uh, M5 has turned out to be uh, a very interesting excavation. This is a plan. Uh, well, here's the stratigraphy at uh, M5. The lowest sediments right down here are A1, 2, 3, and 4. B1, 2, 3, 4, and B5 are higher in the sequence. The basalt is down at the bottom here. Uh, we've been through some of this already. There's no, I think, no need for me to explain everything again. Uh, we know that the interval right here uh, at the end of the A accumulation, at the beginning of the B accumulation, is just there at the top of the Olduvai event, dated to 1.77, 1 1.78 1 uh, million years BP. Here is a slide showing excavations in the lower A levels. This picture was taken in 2009. Uh, it gives you a sense of the complexity of the stratigraphy at Demonisi. Uh, it turns out it's, been a, it's a, been a very difficult place to work in. There was a lot of confusion in the earlier days, uh, more than 15 years ago now, uh, about just how the sediments accumulated, uh, how old they might be. There were suggestions uh, back in the 90s, that perhaps the site was not so old after all. Um, in any case, these are A levels in the deposits. Down here, this is basalt here, and here are these basalt outcrops are everywhere across the site. They make it difficult to work. The basalt itself is, is very rough and jagged. Some of it seems still quite fresh. There are these protrusions and overhangs. 
this is the Kirki, which is a, not actually a, a bed itself, but represents uh, calcareous deposits, which, which uh, uh, were laid down at the interval, largely at the interval between the A and the B deposits. And the, the stringers of calcite actually penetrate both levels. This is one of the piping features here being cleaned out. Uh, there's another one over on this side. Uh, the pipes um, appeared or were formed uh, after the A sediments had been laid down and before most of the B sediments had fallen in the, in the form of ash. Uh, the pipes are thus down within the A sediments uh, and they contain reversed polarity material. Uh, the A sediments themselves, as well as the basalt, are normal polarity. That, for a long time, was confusing. Uh, we now understand that is the, the piping, the pipes that then um, open to the surface and began to collect B age material that contain the human fossils. 1.77 million years of age. Here are a sample of the stone artifacts. Uh, I think you've seen some of these photos before. Um, some crude cores and choppers up above. Uh, the chopper cores are both unifacial and bifacial. Uh, none of them seems to be very sophisticated. There are a number of these chopper cores in the site uh, made from basalt and andesite some of them from a hard, tough-like material. Um, there are also many, many flakes. A lot of the flakes don't show much sign of use. Uh, some have been retouched a little bit. Here are a series of flakes, none of them showing any cortex. Uh, all of this material can be lumped happily within the old oven. All of it represents a mode one industry. Nothing very sophisticated, nothing much different from what you would find in the early uh, layers at Olduvai Gorge in East Africa. Here are some animal bones. Uh, the one up above is the shaft of a humerus, rather large animal. You see one artifact here, which appears to be a carnivore tooth gouge. Uh, a gouge left by a carnivore chewing on the bone, presumably. But on the same specimen, just down here, are some parallel striations, which look very much like cut marks left by a stone edge. Uh, apparently, the carnivore had access to this bone, and the humans uh, also had access, fairly early access, to the, to the same portion of the animal. Um, the humans would have been interested in taking flesh from the bone before it had been fully cleaned off by the carnivores and by the smaller animals and eventually by the, the vultures. Down below here is a, another uh, cervid femur in this case. Uh, there are stone tool marks. Here they are magnified. Uh, again, probably made with a stone flake. Uh, Stone cut marks on bones are, are rather rare at Demonisi. They occur on only perhaps 1% of the bones that have been recovered and cleaned and examined closely with the microscope. Uh, the evidence is rare, but certainly uh, we have good evidence at Demonisi, I think, that the hominins were procuring uh, and eating meat. This would have been important since winters at Demonisi, even close to two million years ago, were probably rather harsh, would have been cold and wet. Uh, perhaps much of the plant material that was available in summertime was not accessible in winter. I should mention that these photos and identifications are those of Martha Tappan. <clears throat> Martha Tappan, who is the archaeologist taphonomist, also working at Demonisi. On to the human material. Uh, this is the first item that was discovered back in 1991. This discovery was made in block one. Uh, it's a, a very nice 
small hominin mandible, uh, very well preserved, although the under parts of the corpus, the, the body of the mandible, are missing, ripped away, and the ascending portions are also uh, missing altogether. There is a full dentition, incisors at the front, canines, uh, premolars and molars. Notice that the M3, the third molar, third permanent molar, is reduced in size a little bit relative to the second or the first. Um, this caused people um, some time ago when the specimen was first described uh, to identify it not just as Homo erectus, but perhaps as a rather late Homo erectus as well. This was in the period before we understood that the site is really close to two million years in age. It's a full adult, although it was probably quite a young adult. There, there is a little bit of wear, but not very much attrition on the cusp surfaces of that M3. That one was found, bear in mind, in 1991. This mandible, very much larger, fully adult, and peculiar in some ways, uh, was found later in block two, 2000 in block two. Uh, it's clearly an older individual. The symphysis here at the front of the jaw is very high, very tall, uh, exceedingly so for the jaw of early homo. Uh, the teeth are, are remarkably worn down. The, the front teeth uh, have been worn down so that uh, only the dentine is left. The, the tooth roots and the dentine, most of the enamel is gone. The wear is peculiar in that it, it is the front surface, the labial aspect of the tooth, which is worn most. Uh, the molars are also worn, although not so heavily. This is the sort of wear that's been identified in much later populations in Neanderthals, for instance, as evidence for uh, what's referred to as paramasticatory use, using the teeth as tools. Uh, we have really no other evidence for that at Demenisi. Uh, also, there are a number of pathological aspects to the jaw. Uh, these roots of the molar shouldn't be showing, of course, they should be enclosed in bone. Uh, the bone itself has been resorbed. There is sign uh, signs here and there of abscessing uh, must have been a, a painful existence for this fellow before he died, and he did presumably live to be quite old. That one is called D2600. Here are D211, the first mandible from block one, and D2600, uh, the second much more massive mandible from block two, found later. Uh, the contrasts in size are indeed dramatic. Uh, this is the sort of evidence that has been taken now for some time uh, to suggest that there are uh, not just one form of human, not just one hominin species at Demenisi, but perhaps two quite different species. Uh, certainly one Homo erectus-like, uh, the other perhaps not. Uh, there have been a number of size comparisons of these two mandibles based on these two jaws published in the last decade. Uh, resampling analyses, rather sophisticated, have been applied. Uh, some workers have concluded that they are so different that they cannot be drawn from a single population. Uh, I don't think that's true. Uh, I said earlier that the under aspect of the corpus of this first small mandible is broken. You can see there that a, a good deal of the bone is missing. The original contour has been lost. It is not possible to measure the, the height, the depth of the corpus at that position, but that is one of the measurements that's been used in comparison to this individual, which is also rather heavily damaged, pathological. Some of those comparisons shouldn't carry very much weight, I think. Another point to consider, as far as these comparisons are concerned, is that the small jaw would likely have increased its dimensions, uh, just a little bit anyway, as the individual had grown further. It was a young adult, a very young adult, but mandibles tend to change and grow 
uh, as the individuals reach middle age. 2282 is a cranium, also from block one, found uh, a full eight years after that first small mandible was discovered. Uh, surprisingly, they fit together. Uh, they are a match. Uh, they represent one skull. There's substantial damage to this face. Much of the central portion of the face is broken out. There's a damage there and there. The, the parts, lower part, the maxilla, uh, doesn't quite meet the upper portion of the face as it should. There's more damage in the skull base and around to the rear. Um, this has been corrected in a reconstruction, a virtual reconstruction, uh, prepared in Zurich by other folks who work uh, in Zurich, who also work with us at Demenisi. Uh, this individual, including the mandible, is the skull of a young adult the, the brow ridge is rather slight, not very protruding, not very heavy. Uh, can't see here, but at the back of the vault, insofar as deformation allows uh, assessment of the contour of the occiput, uh, the contour, again, is female, not so robust as would be expected in a male. So this one is skull two at Demonisi, probably a relatively gracile female. This cranium, you've seen pictures of it just a little while ago, D4500, D4500, uh, is photoed here in situ in 2005, uh, five years after the discovery of the D2600 mandible. Um, surprise, surprise, they fit together. Uh, they constitute a skull, skull five in this case. Uh, let's talk first about the cranium. That's a remarkably robust cranium. Here, lying in the ashy deposits, uh, it hasn't been cleaned at this point. The orbits are still stuffed with matrix. The nasal cavity here, uh, the very long maxilla and the teeth, uh, gives one the appearance of having a, a very large uh, prognathic or projecting face coupled to a, a really tiny brain case, almost like the skull of a gorilla. Um, we were very surprised when it appeared. Uh, there was some trouble getting it out. There was problem with the weather and so on, but eventually it was extracted from this bed of ashy deposit where it had been lying for 1.8 million years. Notice just here uh, that there is a little opening into the surface of the cranium. Now, when it had been extracted from the deposits, when it had been cleaned a little bit, of course, the folks from, from Zurich came and uh, took it to one of the local medical facilities for CT scanning. Uh, they got good imaging. Uh, they did a full reconstruction, virtual reconstruction of the cranium at about that time. Uh, they noticed that this opening actually goes right through the outer table of the frontal, right through the bone into the uh, hollow endocranial cavity inside, occupied by the brain and life. Uh, they described to me that as a peculiar sort of pathology couldn't explain it, really. Uh, I know that at the time the skull was being excavated, uh, one of the excavators simply hammered a large nail right into the vault at that point. So that's the explanation for the peculiar feature. These things do happen in archaeology and paleontology. One shouldn't be surprised. There's the cranium in facial view. Uh, it matches the 2600 mandible, as I've said, uh, and it is very clearly not a small or gracile female, just the opposite. It is a very robust, uh, massive male individual. Uh, of all the skulls, of all the crania at Demenisi, this one, D4500, uh, clearly has the hallmarks of maleness more clearly uh, than any of the others. It's a very fine, very well-preserved specimen. Indeed, 
with its companion mandible, D2600. Uh, this cranium is perhaps the finest representative of Homo, early Homo, uh, ever discovered. Uh, it is peculiar in a number of respects. The cheekbone is very deep. This mid portion of the face is excessively broad in relation to the brow ridges up above. Notice that the brow ridges are very thick. Uh, this region, the glabella portion of the cranium, is projecting. Uh, the maxilla, this distance from the floor of the nasal aperture right down to the space here between the central incisors is very long. And you'll see when the side view is presented, it is also quite projecting. Notice that the teeth in the uh, maxilla, just as in the mandible, are extremely worn. These teeth have been polished right down to the point where almost all of the enamel is missing. Uh, the roots are fine. Uh, the dentine is exposed. It's the same peculiar wear pattern that crops up in the mandible. Of course, the teeth fit together, upper and lower. That's one of the reasons for knowing that D2600 and D4500 are a pair. This has happened twice now at Demenisi, and it most likely will happen again. That is, we have a number of specimens. We are likely to find uh, bits and pieces of the corresponding skeletons as we look further. Skull 5 um, is surprising in a number of respects. This is the brain case enclosing a brain of about 546 cubic centimeters. That's very small as homo skulls go. Uh, the face is very large. Uh, I've done some simple comparisons of the face, facial size relative to the brain case. Uh, the face, using a comparison based on geometric means, is about 70%, 72% the size of the brain case. Uh, that puts skull five in terms of its face-to-brain case proportions right outside the distribution for early Homo and Homo erectus and alongside some of the Australopiths, not very different from Australopithecus. Uh, this combination of a projecting face and a small brain case is comparable indeed to Australopithecus afarensis much earlier species of Australopithecus from Hadar in Ethiopia. Uh, there is, in this case, some of these other points we'll talk about. Here's the nasal aperture. This is the subnasal portion of the maxilla. Perhaps you can see that here, just at the edge of the nose, where the nasal cavity begins to fall down onto the maxilla, there is no crest. Uh, the region is smooth, forward sloping, uh, free of cresting of any sort. Uh, that's a rather primitive characteristic. Most homo noses would have a, a crest here and perhaps an anterior nasal spine as well. The lower face overall is projecting so as to be almost muzzle-like. And the palate, the outline of the palate, if you could open the jaws, look at the palate, uh, you'd see that the palate of this individual is very long so, uh, front to back and relatively narrow side to side. That again is a feature that places this individual, Skull 5, um, apart from the other Demonisi crania, the other Demonisi skulls, and closer indeed to Australopithecus than to early Homo. This individual, Skull 5, has very large teeth. We'll see in a moment. Um, there is no tendency for the last molar teeth, the third molar teeth, to be reduced relative to the M2s or the M1s. In that respect, Skull 5 differs from the other Demonisi specimens for which we have full dentitions to compare. Oh, again. This is a footnote. You've seen photos of some of these postcranial bones, these limb parts. Skull 5, um, not certainly, but probably, 
one can't be quite sure in this case since the parts were not found articulated or side by side. Uh, probably skull five is associated with this Demonici femur. Uh, also with a tibia, there is a patella uh, that completes the joint at the knee. Uh, the tibia would be down here. I don't have a photo of it. There's also a partial foot. Several of the foot bones, the talus, uh, the small bones, and several of the metatarsals uh, from the upper limb. Uh, certainly we have the humerus as well. Um, whether or not this postcranial material is absolutely associated with skull five, uh, we know that the femur was small by human standards, but rather massive. Uh, it has a rather large head. Uh, from the head, from the diameter of the head specifically, it is possible to calculate a body mass, a body weight of close to 50 kilos for this skeleton. Um, an important finding then is that leg length, femur length plus tibia length, tibia is not represented here, uh, relative to body mass, relative lower limb length is in fact uh, greater than in the Australopiths, Lucy, for example, substantially larger than that, although it is not so great as in the Nario Kotome boy, uh, which you saw a photograph of uh, half an hour or so ago. In any case, these people at Demonisi were certainly capable of getting around rather efficiently. Um, that's also uh, a conclusion that can be drawn from the analysis of the foot parts, which we have a sample of just here. Um, this is the, the Demonisi talus. It's very well preserved, quite complete. This is a human talus for comparison. Uh, there is a chimp. Uh, notice that the neck angle here, this angle is about the same in the Demonisi talus as it is in the human close to 25 degrees, whereas it is much more open here in the chimp, that is the neck of the talus uh, carrying the head, tends to look off more to one side in the chimp, uh, whereas the Demonisi individual and the human specimen are very much the same. The foot also displays the elements of a longitudinal arch. That's a very important point. Uh, a number of the metatarsals are present. Some of them are pretty complete. It is possible from the metatarsal array to deduce that the plantar arch, the front to back arch of the foot, a very human-like character, was present at Demonisi. That's not to say that the Demonisi foot was exactly like that of Homo sapiens, probably not exactly like that of later Homo erectus. It was still a bit primitive in some respects, uh, but certainly these people had no trouble getting around in a, in a very upright stance, uh, striding on the ground. I think next week there's going to be a talk by Dan Lieberman, Professor Lieberman from my university. Uh, he will speak more directly about the locomotor capabilities of some of these earlier populations of humans. Uh, perhaps he'll say something about Demonisi as well. I don't know at this point whether our folks were capable of the endurance running, the long distance, slow running, which Dan thinks was characteristic of these earlier groups in Africa, uh, would have helped them in their pursuit of food, of course. It's possible. Uh, just don't know at Demonisi at this point. Um, Further comparisons of the Demonisi crania uh, relative to Homo erectus at this point. Uh, the Demonisi individuals are in blue. Uh, that's skull five down at the bottom of the distribution, 546 cc's. Uh, there are four more crania that are quite complete and can be measured. They sit here relative to Homo erectus in red, Homo erectus mean of some 27 crania, which are complete enough so that they can be measured accurately, is about 1,008 cc's. These are standard deviations, one, 
to three standard deviations from the mean, uh, you'd expect all Homo erectuses to fall between two or three standard deviations from the mean. But in fact, a couple, in fact, three of the Demonici skulls fall outside of that envelope, right at the bottom of the distribution for early Homo, never mind Homo erectus, uh, just within the envelope for Homo habilis. Here are some further comparisons. There are the, the five skulls from Demonici. Number one, 2280 has no mandible. That is, we haven't found it yet. But if we go back to block one, where this particular cranium was recovered in 1999, we might well find the mandible to fit. That is certainly a possibility. Further excavations in block one are warranted, and I expect that if that's done at some point, uh, some of the postcranial bones associated with skull one and skull two may also come to light. Skull three, the small subadult, uh, was found in 2001. Skull four, a very old adult individual, completely edentulous, lacking all of its dentition, quite a peculiar arrangement, um, quite rare in the fossil record. Uh, there are no other early humans which look quite like that, uh, missing all their teeth. It seems almost certain that Skull IV was able to survive for at least a couple of years after the last tooth had been lost. That, of course, raises the question of how this old person managed to subsist. Um, because it sounded good, we've suggested that perhaps other People in the group were helping him through the hard winter periods, um, preparing food, that sort of thing. But of course, we don't know for certain. Skull five. Uh, skull five is high lit in red here, just to point out that the skull is uh, distinctive in a number of its characteristics, as I've said. Uh, the ratio of volume, or the cube root of volume to base breadth is very low in skull five, lower than in the other Demonici crania, lower indeed for Kenimiar 1470, the, the best preserved representative of Homo rudolfensis, lower still than one of the better skulls of Homo habilis, and low in comparison to any of the Homo erectus 20-odd individuals that can be measured. Same thing in terms of height relative to length. Same thing again in terms of globularity. Globularity is a compound measure of uh, skull breadth times skull length divided by skull height squared, giving a sense of the sphericity of the brain case. Uh, very low in the case of D4500 lower than other Demonici individuals, lower also than other early Homo, equal, equaled by just one Homo erectus specimen, which turns out to be a, a rather late specimen from Nandong in Java. Uh, same sort of proportions there, although the brain size is vastly different. The Nandong individuals from Java have brains varying from around 1,000 to over 1,250 cc's or so, far beyond the capacity of the Demonici hominins. A couple of other comparisons, since we seem to have the time. 666-1 um, is this specimen. It's a, it's a maxilla, uh, nasal aspect here. This is the alveolar portion containing the tooth roots. The teeth are in place. That's the side view compared to D4500 from Demonici. Here are the pallets side by side. This one, 666, Australopithecus, uh, sorry, early Homo uh, from the Hadar, Ethiopia, dated to about 2.3 million years before the present. 666-1 is presently the earliest specimen of Homo in the record, uh, the oldest specimen for which we have information. 4,500 in its palatal dimensions overall, 
uh, resembles 666-1. There are similarities in side view also. Notice the forward projecting and sloping uh, subnasal clivus, this portion, similar in 666-1. Um, however, there are some differences, and where these two specimens are different, it's important to note, interesting to see, that it is the Demonisi specimen at 1.78, uh, which is more primitive, morphologically speaking, more like Australopithecus than 666-1. That's true in the case of the business of the cresting at the nasal rim. Also, the palate here, the bony palate of 4,500 is extremely long front to back uh, relative to its side to side width at the level of the M2s. This one is Australopithecus-like in its contour and its shape. This one is more parabolic in contour, more like that of Homo habilis, for example. Oh, tooth dimensions. Teeth, I'm afraid, are kind of boring, and I certainly don't want to talk much about that. Uh, but 4,500 is here in the red, 666-1, down at the bottom, also in the red. Uh, 4,500, as I said, has very worn front teeth, canines, P3s, premolars generally, can't be measured very satisfactorily at all, so I would just discount those figures, which are simply estimates under the circumstances. Uh, in the molar region, 4,500 turns out to have very large teeth, uh, big M2s and big M3s. 666-1 uh, has no permanent M3s left in place. Um, 4,500, in a nutshell, has some of the largest cheek teeth in the Homo record, um, larger than those of most Homo erectus, larger than those of most early Homo. A very large toothed individual in which, again, uh, the M3s are large relative to the M2s. There is no sense of any reduction in the tooth row. Overall, Skull 5, then, is distinctive in a number of respects. Skull 5 is a bit different from uh, any of the earlier Demonisi hominins to be recovered. Uh, there have been these comparisons of the Skull 5 mandible with the very first mandible, the smaller mandible, uh, found in 1991. Some of those comparisons suggested uh, that there might be uh, two species present at Demonisi rather than just one. Um, certainly that issue is still with us. There is the question of the integrity of the sample at Demonisi. Do we have here a situation in which there are several species documented, or is this simply one group representative of a, of a single population over a short period in time? I think we think, the team thinks, that on the basis of shared anatomy, uh, all of the Demonisi skulls compared one against another, on the basis of the CV, the coefficient of variation, useful in comparisons, and on the basis of resampling analyses, that the Demonisi sample uh, does seem to be coherent. That is, all five individuals seem to document a single population. This interpretation is certainly supported by the stratigraphic and taphonomic information. Uh, it seems that not only were the skulls and the postcranial bones deposited uh, in one of those piping or several of those early piping features about 1.77 million years ago, but also uh, this represents a, a brief interval in time. We don't know exactly how much time was involved, but Reed Faring, the geologist who has studied the situation extensively, uh, feels that there were at most uh, a few thousands of years involved. The, the pipe filled with the B1 ashes, the, the humans, some of the other bones were accumulated over a, a brief interval in time. In other words, at Demonisi, there is a single paleodeme, not representatives of multiple species, as many as 
three perhaps, or uh, perhaps four in some counts, certainly not mine, just one species, five individuals, represented by skulls, of course, and also by postcranial material. Demonisi is on that basis uh, particularly a remarkable assemblage. This sort of thing does not happen elsewhere, or at least it hasn't yet. Uh, we have fossil hominins, of course, from a number of other localities in Africa and across Eurasia. Uh, some of them have been mentioned today. Uh, the Turkana Basin, Kubifura. Uh, <clears throat> there's a long sequence of sediments at Kubifura, lots and lots of hominin remains, but they accumulated there uh, over a very long period in time. Same thing in Java, for instance, uh, uh, at Sangiran. Uh, there are a number of humans, very nice specimens, skulls, some postcranial parts, not many, uh, some tools, not many, um, but that sequence represents uh, hundreds of thousands of years duration. That's not the case at Demonisi. So, one has to ask the question, if there is a, a paleodeme at Demonisi, one population not changing much over time, but highly variable, how should this population be recognized taxonomically? Should we group Demonisi, symbolized here by 4,500, but of course, including the other individuals, uh, with Homo habilis, perhaps, or with Homo rudolfensis, this is the iconic Canemir 1470 cranium, now accompanied probably by a pretty good adult mandible. Or, or should we link the Demonisi assemblage with early African Homo erectus? These are the questions that are paramount. Uh, I have some thoughts. Uh, there are a number of comparisons that, be uh, that can be carried out. Uh, I don't want to dwell on each of these characters individually. At Demonisi, the, the cranial capacity is small. Uh, cranial capacities vary at Demonisi from the low end, 546 cc's in the case of Skull 5, to just over 700 cc's in the case of the, of the largest adult individual. Uh, there are other characters of the frontal region, uh, the mastoid, the occiput, the face, which are shared either with Australopithecus or with earlier Homo, Homo habilis. These characters can be described generally as primitive traits. They don't help us a great deal in sorting the Demonisi assemblage or assigning it to a species particularly. Here is an example of the sorts of problems that can crop up. This one, D2700, uh, was found in 2001. Uh, no, sorry, I'm mixing this up. This is KNMR 1813 from Kubifura. Looks a lot like K um, D2700 from Demonisi. Uh, this is a subadult. So there is the problem here of comparing a subadult skull with adult individuals from other groups. Uh, initially, I think that led us astray at Demonisi. We, we drew attention to some of the obvious similarities here between the two, uh, Demonisi and Homo habilis. Um, the state of the dentition suggests that this little cranium was probably um, 14, 15 years old at the most by modern human standards using just the teeth as a guide. Uh, that assessment does not take into account the fact that earlier Homo at Demonisi was probably growing up rather differently from humans as they do today. Uh, the age here should probably be a few years younger. And if that's the case, this D2700 skull had some growing left to do, not the brain, which was probably very close to full size. But here, the brow ridge would have been more protruding in the adult form. The face would have been deeper, probably more projecting uh, deeper in the cheek. And at the back, 
instead of having a smooth, almost rounded contour in the occiput, uh, there would have been a little more of a ridge along the back. The whole individual would have become somewhat more robust, probably, uh, had it been allowed to grow up. This would make 2700 more like some of the other Demonici skulls, less like the Homo habilis individual on the left. At the same time, the Demonici skulls exhibit uh, some more specialized characters, what are called derived features, uh, particularly of the, of the skull itself, characters that are shared specifically with Homo erectus, both early African Homo erectus and later Homo erectus from the Far East. The superorbital torus is one of them. Uh, there are other points here that I think we needn't discuss in detail. This is a parietal bone characteristic angular torus present on the lower corner of the parietal toward the back. <clears throat> uh, some of this, these are characters of the skull base. Little aspects of the detailed anatomy of the cranial base, which pretty clearly align the Demonisi group with Homo erectus rather than with Homo habilis, say, or with Australopithecus. So, despite its peculiar morphology, despite its highly distinctive character, um, D4500, like the other Demonisi skulls, seems to resemble Homo erectus, represented here by KNMER 3733 from East Africa. Here's another one of the Homo erectus, early Homo erectus slash Homo ergaster crania from Eastern Africa, uh, 1.6, 1.65 million years old. Demonisi, there is Homo habilis and there is Homo rudolfensis. I would say, along with all of the other uh, detailed resemblances, that even 4,500 uh, appears to share the, the bow plan of Homo erectus. In conclusion, then, the Demonisi skulls clearly are primitive in a number of respects, and they share characters with earlier Homo, uh, Homo habilis particularly, also to some extent with species of Australopithecus, both Australopithecus africanus from South Africa, also Australopithecus afarensis from East Africa. Nevertheless, it is appropriate on the basis of the derived characters, the more specialized morphological attributes of the group, to characterize it as Homo erectus, very early and in some respects primitive Homo erectus. Uh, characters such as the very low cranial capacity do not necessarily rule out this hypothesis. Now, this is fine. We can lump the Demonisi individuals with Homo erectus, but if that is done, clearly there will be some further erosion of the differences between Homo erectus, especially as classically known from the Far East, larger skulls, very distinctive anatomically, and the other early taxa from Africa, Homo habilis in particular. Uh, it's going to be from this point forward, simply because the Demonisi population, the Demonisi paleodeme is so highly variable, difficult in the future to draw such firm conclusions about the nature of our family tree. It's going to be harder and harder as we find more specimens, particularly isolated specimens, to make good informed uh, conclusions about the phylogeny of these groups. We live in interesting times. I'm told, may you live in interesting times as an old Chinese curse. That seems to be the case uh, as far as paleoanthropology is concerned in any case. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.